Hi everyone, I'm William Dennis, a product manager on Google Cloud, working on GKE Autopilot. I'll be joined later by my colleague Gary, who's going to take you through a few demos. I'm excited to talk to you today about GKE's new Autopilot mode of operation to help streamline your application delivery and management. Before getting into the details of GKE Autopilot, I'd like to quickly go over some different options you have today for deploying your applications. You can run them the traditional way on VMs, directly using GCE, or build them for serverless with Cloud Run. And sitting in the middle is Kubernetes with GKE. As you move up the layers of abstraction from raw VMs where you manage everything, through Kubernetes, which offers container orchestration and management, to serverless, where you just provide your container to run, your, op your operations get easier as there's less for you to manage, but your deployment choices and flexibility is a little bit reduced as you go up the stack at the same time. That's essentially the trade-off. You're trading the flexibility to deploy things however you'd like with the need to manage all that custom configuration. So what makes Kubernetes the pop such a popular choice? The main reasons I hear are that you have some requirements that are not necessarily solved by a higher order product. While it's great if you can adapt everything to your serverless, and frankly speaking, if you can, I would recommend it. A lot of the time, the reality is there's just stuff you don't want to change. Maybe you're bringing over a bunch of existing applications. Maybe you need to run a fairly complex deployment with state that needs an attached persistent disk. And sure, in those cases, people will tell you, hey, you need to get rid of that persistent disk and go use a managed product. And well, they might be right some of the time. But practically speaking, it's not always an option. Maybe the state is for a custom database that you're the one responsible for managing. Maybe there is no managed solution available. Or maybe you just don't want to change things. Kubernetes is a very practical deployment environment which understands that you have a lot of different applications, some legacy, some new ones, and they have various requirements that can be pretty complex. So it is in turn a fairly powerful system for handling these requirements. What about compared to VMs? Well, if you run stuff in VMs, you have to manage all those VMs, which can be quite a burden. You need to worry about where your application is going, on which VM, you have to worry about the health of those VMs, and so on. Kubernetes sits right in the middle of this spectrum. It's not too low level, and, that make, and it's not too high level, and that makes it very a very attractive deployment platform for a lot of users. Add to this a few other properties, like the fact it's based on open source technology, so you can move your deployments around, and it becomes very attractive indeed. Kubernetes can run pretty much anywhere, so you might be running Kubernetes on-prem, you might be running in other clouds. Using Kubernetes in all these environments makes your deployments standardized and portable. So what are the actual components in Kubernetes that offer this flexibility that makes it so attractive? Kubernetes ships with many components out of the box, including deployment for stateless web applications, stateful set for custom databases, and anything else that needs a persistent disk. For batch jobs, there's the job object. If you need to run an agent on every node, such as to capture logs, you have the daemon set. Added to this are some scheduling constructs like zonal affinity and pod topology spread patterns that allow you to design your workload around failure domains, as well as priority and preemption that give you fine-grained access to the scheduling priority to enable rapid scaling of high-priority workloads. At a technical level, all these constructs are represented in Kubernetes objects through the Kubernetes API. You can describe a whole bunch of things. Even at this level, at the Kubernetes API level, what zones you want to run in or how you want to spread your pods for fault tolerance. Say if you want to co-locate two different apps together on a node so that each machine is running the front end and back end application while at the same time being spread out over a zone, you can do that. Now, Kubernetes does have a bit of a reputation for having a steep learning curve. After all, there's a lot of different things here, many of which I just talked about. And that reputation may be somewhat deserved. But let me make a couple of claims. Firstly, if you just need to deploy a simple web application, then as my colleague Gary is going to demonstrate, it's not that hard at all. You only need to learn two API constructs, a deployment, which houses your code, and a service, which is how you expose your application to the internet. That's it. So don't feel like you have to learn everything all at once, but know that it's there if and likely when you need it. And secondly, as a professional, you're not necessarily always looking for the simplest tools out there, right? Simple is good, don't get me wrong, but what you really need are powerful tools. You want to make sure that the deployment tools you are using can actually deliver all the things that you need to do. And Kubernetes is really good at doing that. So I'd say it's worth learning. Now, one of the things that makes Kubernetes a little more challenging, though, is that you traditionally need to learn two systems. 
you need to learn the Kubernetes architecture, that is the open source API components above the line on the screen here. And you also need to learn the platform API like GKEs. At the GKE layer, you create the cluster and provision it with the compute capacity your workloads need or set up autoscalers to do that for you. And once created, you have a shared responsibility for those compute resources and may need to debug node issues from time to time. This is just how Kubernetes works and the overhead you incur for getting the benefits and power of Kubernetes, right? At least that's how it used to be. This is why we created Autopilot for GKE. Autopilot joins what we now call the standard mode of operation, giving you two ways to use GKE. With Autopilot, most of the platform details are handled for you automatically. It's still the same GKE that you know and love. We just now have a new way for you to operate it. This is the cluster creation page for GKE Autopilot. As you can see, it's pretty simple. In fact, these are all the settings you need to get yourself a functioning production grade cluster. You just need to give your cluster a name, pick the region and configure network. So hopefully coming up with a name isn't so hard. As for the region, you may have a favorite already. Otherwise, generally, you would just pick the one closest to your users. For networking, if you have public networking, you don't need to do anything more. For private networks, you just need to specify your subnets and ranges like normal. And, and that's it. I mean, that's really it. Sure, there's a, there's a couple of additional security features that you can enable or disable below the fold, or you can just accept our secure defaults and change it later if you need to. Importantly, there is no node or auto-scaling setup needed. Just go ahead and click the Create button, get your production grade cluster. Going back to the API view of the world, what does this mean? Well, basically, we shrank the whole GKE API service down to a single core, the Create core. As for the Kubernetes API, which is how you represent your workloads, well, that's still there. And this is really the point. Our goal with Autopilot is to support most of those workloads that GKE standard does today. In particular, we still support all those stateful workloads that need a persistent disk. Our goal here is not to change the Kubernetes API, just the platform it runs on. So how does this work? <clears throat> how can we still offer most of the Kubernetes features of GKE standard while reducing the platform API to just the create function? Well, with Autopilot, you describe your workloads in Kubernetes terms, as you always have, like your container image and the resources it needs. Once scheduled on a GKE cluster running in autopilot mode, we'll automatically figure out the node resources needed to run those workloads and provision enough capacity for you. For example, if your container requests two CPU cores and six gigabytes of memory, we'll provision a node big enough to handle it. We apply the best practices that we've learned from six years of running GKE, giving you a production grade cluster without the hassle. So that's handy. <clears throat> but what about after the cluster is created? This is actually where the real benefit of Autopilot comes in. With a traditional Kubernetes platform, including GKE's standard mode of operation, there is a shared responsibility over the nodes. While GKE standard handles the life cycle of those nodes, for example, the creation, updating, deleting, and offers several features to help automate, like auto repair, at the end of the day, those nodes are still VMs that you need to manage. You have admin access to them and can potentially modify them to behave in ways that GKE might not expect. So for Autopilot, we looked at this and asked, do you come to GKE for the ability to be the root user on those nodes, or are you primarily looking to run your own applications on this platform? We believe for most, the goal is to run your own business applications, so that's what we offer here. In this mode, you're responsible for describing your workloads and running them. If your workload crashes due to a bug in your code, hate to say it, it's still your problem. But most other components related to the nodes are now Google's responsibility, along with the cluster itself. This is a big deal. And so with this, we introduced a pod level SLA for the first time on GKE, it's three nines. This means you now have a cluster that's easier to set up and easier to manage. So as a developer, you're more productive, and in production, you spend less time on the minutiae of managing the thing, and more time running your application, which is presumably what you're ultimately here to do. The third major difference with this mode of operation is how resources are built. Since you describe everything at a pod level, we bill you at a pod level as well. 
It's kind of intuitive and it brings with it some nice benefits. One benefit is you don't have to be a so-called Kubernetes bin packing expert because you no longer care if your node has 32 pods or zero or whether your node's CPU has been fully allocated or not because all of that is now our problem. Our system is responsible for packing pods onto nodes and if there's any wasted spare capacity, that's on us. You don't pay for it. So it's a really nice billing model as well. And with this comes another nice attribute. If you're running a multi-team setup, you can now figure out how much each namespace costs just by adding up all the pod requests in that namespace. And we even have tools to help you with that. What's more is that Autopilot comes with a strong security posture right out of the box. We implement the GKE hardening guidelines, and since the nodes are more locked down in order for us to provide management and that SLA, you have the benefit of the reduced node surface area as well. You won't need to worry about unpatched nodes either, since we will keep everything up to date automatically. And if automatic updates worry you, fear not, as we have several tools to manage that as well, including maintenance windows and pod disruption budgets. So coming back to the Kubernetes workload constructs I presented earlier, and uh, one of the main reasons why people use Kubernetes in the first place, let's have a look. Do they work on autopilot? The answer is, for the most part, yes, and in the same way. Deployments, stateful set, jobs, they all work exactly the same way. Yes, even that complex stateful custom database will just work on autopilot with no additional platform and specific configuration needed. You can move it right on over. Let me repeat this because it's so important. We understand that a lot of users run stateful workloads in their clusters. So when we created Autopilot, we didn't take any shortcuts here. Everything just works for stateful set as you would expect from GKE. Now, since pods running on Autopilot don't have admin privileges, it does alter some use cases, especially for, deployment, uh, for daemon sets. But this is mostly in the domain of administrative functions, the exact type of functions we hope won't be needed anymore. And we've engaged several key partners to deliver their solutions on Autopilot for logging, monitoring, and security in the same way they work on GKE standard, covering many of the popular daemon sets that we see. There's a couple of other features like GPUs, which GKE standard offers, that's currently lacking in Autopilot. For the full list, see our comprehensive Autopilot overview documentation. I'll put a link in the description below. So we launched Autopilot about half a year ago, and companies like Ubi are already seeing the benefit of this approach. Ubi, if you haven't heard of them yet, it's an innovative medical technology startup based in Japan. They found that with Autopilot, they were able to focus more on doing the thing that they created their company to do, which is to build better healthcare solutions and less on managing the cluster and all the infrastructure. You can read all about this case study on our website, which I highly recommend. Again, I'll put a link in the description below. And with that, I want to hand it over to my colleague, Gary, who's going to run through a practical demo using Autopilot. Over to you, Gary. Thanks, William. In this demo, we'll try to deploy a standard web application with a Redis backend on Autopilot. The application has three services, a Redis leader with a single replica, a Redis follower, which actually has three replicas, and a, Redis, and a front end web application, which has three replicas as well. Now let's deploy this application. All right, now let's check the status of our pods. Now notice that we have one in the ready state and several in the pending state. That's because we actually don't have enough compute resource provisioned in the cluster. But not to worry, Autopilot will handle this for us. Behind the scenes, Autopilot is actually provisioning additional compute for us. Let's take a look. You can see that here we've added uh, one new node and we have two new nodes uh, in the provisioning status right now. If we take another look at our pods, we'll see that we actually have a couple more in the container creating stage. We'll wait for a little bit, uh, but soon we'll see all of our applications. So all of our pods will actually be deployed. All right, let's check our pod status one more time. 
All right, all of our pods are running. We'll also notice we now have five nodes up and running as well uh, to meet the demands. Now, let's actually uh, test out this application. We need to uh, get the address of the um, front end application. All right, we can see that the uh, external IP address here is that. We'll copy that, paste it into our browser. All right, we have the guestbook application. We'll type in a few messages here. All right, we'll close this out. But if all is working, we should uh, see these messages back again coming from the cache. All right, our application is up and running. All is well. Now in this demo, we showed the ability of autopilot to automatically and dynamically provision compute as needed by your workload. We didn't get into auto scaling, but William's gonna tell us a bit about that. And then I'll be back with another demo to show you uh, that as well. Thanks, Gary. So as Gary showed, Autopilot will automatically provision resources to schedule your pods under the hood based on the resources those pods request. But what about scaling the workloads themselves? For this, GK offers two pod level scaling options. The vertical pod autoscaler can increase and decrease the resources used by the pod. It does this by monitoring the resource utilization of the pod, and it can adjust the pod requests, either increasing it to improve performance when it notices more CPU might be needed, or decreasing it when it sees that the CPU is being underutilized. And with Autopilot, that's all you need to do. Autopilot will ensure that you have the right node resources available to run those resized pods. And of course, you only pay for the precise resource requests of your pod. To enable in GKE Autopilot, create a vertical pod autoscaling object that references your deployment. You can optionally exclude certain containers in the pod from the VPA. I'll put a link to the documentation in the description below. The other workload scaling option is the horizontal pod autoscaler or HPA. The horizontal pod autoscaler can change the number of pod replicas in your deployment based on demand. With the horizontal pod autoscaler, you set a metric to observe and a target and the HPA will attempt to create more pod replicas to keep that target in range. For example, if you want to have one pod for every 100 requests per second that hit your load balancer, it could do that. With GKA Autopilot, you can just set and forget this HPA and let it handle the usage spikes for you, as, G as Autopilot will provision and deprovision automatically the compute resources needed to handle those pods. And of course, as always, you only pay for running pods. To enable, Create a horizontal pod autoscaling object that references the deployment to be scaled, sp specifying the minimum and maximum replica counts, the metric to be observed, and your desired target. Horizontal pod autoscaling can be configured to use CPU, memory, or custom metrics like requests per second or pub sub queue depth. Now I'd like to hand it back to Gary, who's gonna show you a really cool demo of using autopilot with a horizontal pod autoscaler to handle a pub sub queue. Back over to you, Gary. Thanks, William. In this demo, we're going to show how to auto scale a PubSub workload based on metrics provided by Google Cloud Monitoring. As you can see, we've already created a topic named Echo and a corresponding subscription named Echo Read. The goal for this demo is to scale the number of subscribers for this topic based on the number of unacknowledged messages remaining in the subscription. As you can see on the screen, PubSub conveniently provides this metric for us, and later we'll actually show how to configure the horizontal auto horizontal pod autoscaler to use it. Now, this is all made possible by using the custom metrics adapter, which will provide cloud monitoring metrics for our cluster. Now, while William was talking, I actually took the liberty of deploying this adapter. So let's take a quick look just to make sure everything's running. All right, so now we see we have our custom metrics adapter up and running. Now we can actually check to make sure that the metric that we want is available by querying the Kubernetes external metrics API. And here in response, you'll see that we have our subscription number undelivered messages metric, and we actually see that we have it for our actual subscription. So we'll be set up to use this in the HPA later on. But 
Before we can deploy our application, we'll need to configure an identity the app can use to authenticate with Cloud Pub Sub. Autopilot workloads use workload identity, which is the recommended way to access Google Cloud services from applications. It provides improved security and manageability over using things like secrets or mounting token files, which are insecure. First, let's create a dedicated namespace for our application. Great, we'll use the namespace PubSub. Next, we'll need to create a service account that we'll actually use in our deployment metadata. We'll call it PubSub service account. We also need to create a Google Cloud service account And we'll need to give it permission to actually access PubSub. Here you see we're giving it the PubSub editor role. Next, we'll actually bind those, the Kubernetes service account with the Google service account. And finally, we'll annotate the Kubernetes service account so that it knows about this binding. Now, let's take a look at our actual application itself. The actual application itself is a simple app which uses the Python SDK to actually just pull messages from the subscription. Now, our deployment for this application is pretty simple. We have a standard container. We're gonna name it, you know, PubSub. And as you can see here, we've actually uh, chosen the service count under which this particular uh, deployment will actually run. Now, along with that, we also have a horizontal pod autoscaler resource. And as you can see here, uh, we showed this metric earlier. We're using the external metric. We're using the under, uh, undelivered messages. We want this to be for our echo read subscription. And our goal here will be that we never want to, no matter how many subscribers we have, we want the average value of the backlog to actually be five. All right, so let's actually deploy our application. First, we'll just set the default namespace for our context. Then we'll actually deploy our pod. We'll check to make sure our pod is running. All right, we successfully deployed that. Next, we'll actually deploy the HPA resource. And let's take a quick look. Here we can actually see that we have it set up as a, a target of five. That's what we configured in there. The min pods is one and the max pods are five. And right now we don't actually have any med, med, uh, messages. So the backlog is zero and our deployment is actually fine. Now let's actually generate some load. We'll do that by publishing about a hundred messages to the topic itself. All right, now that our message has been there, let's take a look at the HPA itself. As you can see here, it's actually updated now, right? We actually see that the value that it's seeing here is 22 and it's looking for a value of five. So if we actually describe the HPA, we'll see that it actually wants to trigger up and auto scale our stuff up to the max size of actual five. Let's take a quick look at our pods. You see that we've now actually scaled up to four pods and we have a fifth pod pending. So as you can see here, we were able to 
build an application, have it subscribe, uh, set the metric based on uh, the unacknowledged backlog from Google Cloud metrics and auto scale our application. And once again, the great thing here was we didn't have to worry about any of the underlying compute resources uh, required for this to actually work. All right, you'll see that our container is actually creating. And um, yeah, and that's about it for this demo. So thanks, William. Back over to you. Thank you, Gary. That was a really powerful demonstration of what Autopilot can do. All you need to do is add your Kubernetes workload and we'll take care of everything else. Well, that's GKE Autopilot. To learn more, you can visit the link on the screen or those in the description below. Thank you.